Hello, I'm Rebecca Johnstone here on the BCIT Burnaby campus, and we have a very special guest today, Carol Taylor. Carol, welcome. Thank you so much for being here. I'm very happy to be here. It's a pleasure. We're going to dive right into our conversation. You were a journalist for a long time, first at the CPC and CTV, and I'm sure that you saw the industry change a lot in your tenure. How important is journalism today in 2021? Oh, I think it's never been more important. And I also would say I've never been more discouraged because what I've seen happen to journalism in the last few years is this narrow ideological approach to things so that if you turn on one television station, that's the only point of view you hear and you turn on another and then you only hear that point of view. Journalism to me is the roundness of every subject so that you ask the questions and understand all the positions before you do your story and go to air. But I think we've lost it, you know, and, and so when I look at BCIT and the opportunity to build new foundations for new people coming into journalism, I think that's the one thing I would emphasize. We are desperate for good journalism. We're desperate for people who really want to find the truth. So what does that look like to you? What would you want to see on a station so that you were hearing multiple sides of a story? So that I would like to, even if you're doing a panel, for instance, which we all do lots of, and yes, they might have different points of view, but what they do is they let people just yell at each other and override each other. And I've seen too many news stations pick just the extremes. So they can say, yes, we covered the right, and yes, we covered the left. But that's not where most people are. And so I look for, and I'll, an example is Fareed Zakaria, because he picks guests that really have time to say what their point of view is, and someone else will have a different point of view, but they're not encouraged to talk over one another or be unpleasant to one another. And so if I'm the audience, I learn, and then I can make my own decisions. So I would like to see far more of really good debate, but also good journalism when someone goes out to do a story that they put it in context. It's not just the headline today. It's, you know, how does this fit into what's going on in society? Yeah, that's, that's actually a really, really interesting point because it's all about SEO and trying to get that like clickbait so that people click on your story. And I guess the journalism could be at risk. I used to, and I drove a young journalist nuts, but when I was in municipal politics, a, a young journalist would come covering the city and they, their editor would have said, oh, illegal suites, whatever the issue is. And they'd come with their, their mic and that's what they'd want to talk to. And I, I wasn't a politician that ever ducked. And I, so I'm not gonna give you a round and round story, but I wanna put this in context first. So I said, I'll tell you the context, then I'll answer your question. And so I'd say, well, in the 70s, this is what happened to housing. This is what happened to zoning. This is where we went off track. Now ask your question. Yeah. And because it was just my way of trying to educate and bring journalists along with me as I tried to understand the problems. In your broadcasting career as a successful female journalist, what was your experience like in an industry that was so dominated by men? Well, there were no role models for me, really. I mean, I started as a teenager. There were no journalism schools, no role models. Um, but I would say that it was um, tough to get out of the stereotype. If you did make it as a woman, I can remember doing Canada AM and the expectations, even though we were co-hosts, male, female, supposedly equal, uh, you know, I had to fight not to be handed the recipes to do on the show that I wanted to do the prime minister or I wanted to do the serious political things. And so I had to keep standing up and mentioning it. And sometimes I was successful and sometimes not. Mind you, I was paid half what my male co-host was paid. That wouldn't happen today. But at that time, it was, um, it was new for everybody to have women who were coming onto the stage at that level. I, I would imagine um, you would have to be a very powerful leader and really know your vision to be able to hold powerful space. Um, you had to know your material. Yeah. You had to really, um, I think, overlearn, overeducate, overunderstand so that you could show that, uh, you know, you really had something serious to offer. Well, you're paving the way for people like me, so 
Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you for choosing journalism because I do think it's so crucial to how we as a society behave, how we understand, how we hopefully come together. We're not coming together right now, yeah. but journalism has a role to play. You started your career as a journalist reporting on politics and then you made the leap into politics yourself. What was the inspiration behind that? Well, I care about public policy and have for as long as I can remember. And so I would always be interviewing people and whether it was elected politicians or people who were coming along and I'd say, um, you know, what's your position on this? What's your position on that? And then I'd try to encourage business people, for instance, to go into politics because we can't just have, you know, the political assistant who makes it to the top. We've got to have uh, elected people who represent all of our community. And so I'd say, why don't you consider politics? Why don't you run? And I got tired of hearing myself saying it to everybody else. And at some point I looked in the mirror and thought, if I think that other people should be doing public service, I've got to do it too. In your time as, as BC's finance minister, you oversaw the implementation of multiple budgets, as well as you oversaw the BC carbon tax. How was that idea received then compared to now? It, I have the scars on my back, if you'd like to see them. <laughs> it was not easy. Uh, the Premier decided that we, as a whole government, were going to go green. And so every minister had different responsibilities, and they had to look within their own ministry to see what they could do better and how they could change. So finance, of course, is about taxation and revenue and those issues. But with a carbon tax, you had to be very careful because you couldn't talk about it in public. Because if you do, it moved the market. If I had shown in any way that we were going to bring in a carbon tax, then those companies that would benefit their stock might go up, some other company's stock might go down, and you cannot, you cannot interfere with the marketplace in that way. So it was quite difficult doing the research that I had to do and talk to all the opposing views before we actually designed it. So what I would say in public was, we're considering everything. If you have any opinion, whether it's carbon tax or cap and trade, let me know. So it was a broad way of saying, I, I'm not going to show my hand, but this is what yeah. we're looking at. And then in finance, it was one of the best public policy things that I've been involved with because it had to be so quiet and so tight, just with maybe half a dozen people in the finance ministry. And we thought there'd be something somewhere in the world we could just pick up and use. We couldn't find a comprehensive carbon tax anywhere. There's some that just did gasoline, some that did bits and pieces. So we modeled it. And in modeling it, I kept thinking, how is this going to affect, you know, the family with three kids and they've got the van because they're an SUV, they need it. How much gas do they take? What's that going to do to the cost of living? What about the guy that lives up north and has to have a pickup truck or the senior who's got a really old furnace that's burning fuel? So in our modeling, we kept saying, okay, how much revenue will come in from this? Who is, who, who's really being hurt? And how do we give back dollars to those individuals so that they come out revenue neutral? And we really meant revenue neutral. So by legislation, we said every penny that comes in must go out in tax cuts. And it's changed now. Different politicians have different ideas. But I think that was an essential reason to get it passed. And it wasn't easy. And lots of people, even in our own party, didn't like it. And the NDP ran the next election on Axe the Tax. And that was astounding because the environmentalists who wanted it, of course, and usually voted NDP, came swimming over to the Liberals because we had actually done it. I had always thought about the leadership skills that would be required to have a decision and stick to it. I didn't think about the financial implications of how different people could benefit and how quiet you would have to keep it yes. to not sway. It was a really interesting, amazing exercise. And I now see different models being tried around the world, but I, I really felt that ours was the right one because we were thinking about how it affected people. And I was interviewing Premier Horgan just last week, and the subject came up. And I said, 
that I had some scars on my back. And he said, yes, I think I gave you some. <laughs> I said, I remember. <laughs> it's just nice that you can be friends now. Oh, we are, um, totally. When you think about legacy, what's the most important thing for you? Well, everyone wants to make a difference. So you have to hope that in some small ways, maybe you made a difference. With our last question, why is it important to give back? When I think of my family or I think of society, uh, there's so many people in need and we're in very privileged positions. And I think it's our responsibility always to be thinking about others, how we can help and try to support others in any way we can. And it doesn't have to be headline ways, just small ways of trying to help others and, and uh, do your best. That was our interview with Carol Taylor here in the newly named Carol Taylor Broadcast Journalism Studio. Rebecca Johnstone in Burnaby for BCIT Magazine.